I noticed as I was prayerfully reading over the bulletin the notation at the very, very end that we find out there how many times some of these expressions occur. So evidently this is authoritative. How could it be otherwise? Ecclesiastes, the word God occurs 41 times. Vanity and vanities, 37 times. Under the sun, 29 times. Under heaven, 2 times. Labor, 23 times. Evil, 22 times. And vexation, 10, 10 times. So, now that must be authoritative. We certainly found these terms and expressions occurring many, many times. And for those who appreciate literature as literature, recognizing that it is an art, will not fail to see uh, the scheme in, in all of this. Now the book of Ecclesiastes has given some people uh, trouble because they have not understood this book in the Old Testament that we're, that we're studying. They do not realize that the man, in this instance Solomon, is an old man now. He's coming to the close of his career. He's had a lot of experiences uh, in life. And in talking to the young man, just as a professor would in a class in moral philosophy, he, he confesses. Uh, rather obliquely but nevertheless confesses his own failures and he goes back to tell what he experimented with what he tried and what viewpoints he had at that time and then he includes uh, moral suggestions to the young man people have found trouble with the expressions that he uses for example uh, these were, this was the way he thought in the days of his apostasy. And now looking back upon it, he recognizes the futility. But people have found a fault with it and they've wondered about it. Uh, when, for example, he seems to be somewhat indefinite about the hereafter by raising a question uh, when he says uh, in that the third chapter, well, who knows? Who knows what's in the hereafter? And people have wondered, well, why would a man, man uh, talk like that? Uh, if, if God had revealed himself to him, why doesn't he say what it's going to be like? But you see, it's part of the, it's part of the uh, reasoning process as he's bringing this young man along with him in his thinking. And he's uh, challenging him in that form of, of a way uh, how do you know what's going to be uh, in the hereafter making him think about it then people have found fault with him because in the seventh chapter he uh, speaks about a rather strange mod form of moderation when he says uh, don't get too too righteous and, and don't get too wicked well it has to be understood in the in, in the context, of course. And then uh, folks have found fault with this when they've seen uh, that he seems to have a low estimate of women. My, when you read it without knowing the background and you don't have the sweep of the book, why well, he says, I, uh, uh, among men, he said, my uh, real good guy, he said, I, I may have found one in a thousand. But women? Oh, no. Well, you have to understand what he's going through. Remember that this man had failed God, failed God miserably, and had accumulated wives and concubines. But when you continue to read, you'll b begin to see that he says he's advocating just one wife, and he says to the young man, now you enjoy the wife of your youth as long as you live. Then uh, people have found fault with him because of his 
expressions, for example, concerning happiness, where you have the expression in the 8th chapter, eat and drink and be merry. But what he's saying is that in this life, if, there's, if this is all there is to it, then uh, that's about the best you can get out of it. What, what else is there, you see? And it's very important to understand that. Now, when did he get these, uh, these philosophies? Remember how it begins in the very first chapter. He says, the word of the preacher, the son of David. That's in the very first verse, and king in, in Jerusalem. So he tells us right away, these are his own words. These are his own words. He's not claiming to be speaking by divine inspiration here though it was divine inspiration that caused him to give this discourse and it was divine inspiration that caused it to be properly recorded and properly uh, uh, perpetuated down through the years so that you can have it today and translated in our own in our own language he announces at the very beginning that the opinions expressed are his own and not not necessarily uh, someone else's. You, you see, he makes that very, very plain as he's telling this young man, this is where I was, this is what I thought, and this is what conclusions I came to, proving the point that the thinking man who faces the facts that this one is, is setting forth is compelled, is compelled, the thinking man is compelled to see this life as emptiness. And he's compelled, he is compelled to think that there is a God and there is death and there is judgment, you see. In, if you're open now to the first chapter, you might look at verse 13 where he says that he put his heart into seeking out by his wisdom concerning all things. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done uh, under the sun. He repeats it, of course, in chapter 7, verse 25. So he makes it very plain that he has done some research and he was diligent about it to find the answers to all of these great problems. And where did he get his information? Look at verse 16. He confesses that he consulted with himself. I commune with mine own heart. I commune with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I'm come to great estate and and so forth. And his opinions at that time were the results of his application of human logic showing the futility of a materialistic uh, attitude and a materialistic philosophy that says, well, just live for now, and, and, and so on. We've gone over that. But is the human heart the best source for accurate conclusions. Is the human heart the best place to get the right conclusions? Is it? I don't think so. In fact, the Word of God says it isn't. Many of you are familiar with Jeremiah 17, 9. What do we read there? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now why don't we repeat that so everybody will know it. This is Jeremiah 17 uh, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know? And so you have a deceitful heart and it's wicked and so you go there to get your source material and to get your conclusions. That's not smart, is it? You, you see, in so many ways, 
He is showing the futility of the human intellect to get a satisfactory answer to what it's all about. And he's leading that young man on to understand this. He carries him with him in, in the things that he's gone through. And you remember we studied together that he tried wisdom and works and wine and all of these things, including wealth and treasures. And his conclusion is that none of these things really satisfy because God has put inside of man something that yearns and aches and cries out for more than that. That doesn't mean that the natural man is crying out for God. I do not subscribe uh, to the theories that some people have uh, that people just everywhere are hungry for God. Oh, they are certainly are not. My Bible tells me that there is none that seeketh after God. Isn't that what your Bible says too? Oh, but people can still be hungry. People can still be craving. People can still be yearning. But it isn't God they're looking for. No, they're looking to satisfy something within in them. Because God has put the world in their heart. That is, he's put eternity in their heart. He's put something within them that makes them inquisitive. It makes them anxious. It makes them desiring to ex explore and very anxious to perpetuate their own existence and, and so forth. Now this man had knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge were given to Solomon. You will remember that it is recorded in Second Chronicles that God said to him when he ascended to the throne upon the death of his father David that uh, you now come to a place of grave responsibility and I am prepared as the almighty God to grant your wish. Do you have one particular wish? And I'll grant it. And Solomon said, Lord, I need wisdom in order to be the king over this great nation and God promised him that wisdom and knowledge is to be granted unto thee and certainly God gave it I jotted down a passage in 1st Kings chapter 4 beginning with verse 30 if you'd like to turn to it you'll find an expression there of this man's great wisdom this is 1st Kings chapter 4 and in verse 30. Notice, and Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt, the east country and of Egypt. His wisdom was far above that. Verse 32, And he spake three thousand proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five. Verse 33, notice the subdivisions here. And he spake of trees, from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. And he spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes and so forth. Great wisdom and great knowledge. Verse 34. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. You know, he could have started a university right there because they would have been glad to come and they did come they did come to hear him speak about all of these the subjects and sciences great wisdom great knowledge but notice that even the most excellent of human wisdom has its limitations 
Man can think, man can reason, and for that reason he's responsible before God as a moral creature, but man has its, his limitations. Can man, by all of his wisdom and what he knows about birds and fishes and agriculture and so forth, engineering, can he by that know God? I think of the words of Zophar as recorded in the book of Job, in 11th chapter, verse 7, where he speaks to Job saying, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out God unto perfection? It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? So human wisdom, even the best, with its logic and its reasonings and its knowledge, has its limitations. Can a man find out about God? No. Man can only imagine about God. And that's the reason you have, there are so many gods. So many gods today and so many gods in ancient times. Because men consulted with their own hearts, with their own imaginations, and tried to figure out what these powers might be, uh, this being might be that's greater than they. No man can know who God is except by God's revelation and what he has been pleased to give, and that is, of course, the Bible. We'll be looking at that a little more at our dedication one week from, from tonight. The Apostle Paul uh, showing the futility of human wisdom says, where is the wise? This is in 1 Corinthians one twenty. Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? But God hath chosen, he says in verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Human wisdom compared with divine revelation, the light that God gives to man concerning himself and his purposes is as foolishness. In the second chapter of that first Corinthians that has been uh, studied in the evening school of the Bible, we read that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So you see, human wisdom is not only has its limitations, but it is incapable of understanding God or knowing who he is and having some grasp of God's eternal purposes. But even when God grants to man the, the privilege to have much knowledge and about many things, Yet that doesn't keep man from sin, does it? God gave to this man, Solomon, great knowledge and great wisdom with respect to, as we've just read there in, in the first Kings, uh, statecraft, and biology, and botany, agriculture, and uh, reptilia, he knew all about snakes, and uh, ophidiology marine life and engineering and so forth with all of that wisdom without obedience to God's revelation God's light from above man plays the fool and Solomon did that in the uh, 11th chapter of First Kings we have a record of that of this man 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 6. Now here's a man with great wisdom. Not only natural talent you understand, but wisdom given him by God for statecraft, for engineering, in the sciences, and other things that are mentioned elsewhere in the scripture, so that the queen of Sheba just marveled at this man's wisdom and princes and leaders 
from other countries came just to sit at his feet and listen to this Jew who had such wisdom. Nevertheless, all of that did not keep him from sin. And this is part of his, his purpose in writing Ecclesiastes and speaking as he does because he played the fool. And now as he's along in years, he admonishes the young man, fear God, prepare to die, prepare for judgment, you see. But now let's, let's look at this man in 1 Kings eleven six, And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place. This was a shrine for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, to that great uh, heathen idol in the hill that is before Jerusalem in proximity to the holy temple that Solomon himself had built for God and for Molech the abomination of the children of Ammon, another leading pagan deity. Solomon, are you crazy? What's the matter with you? You see, all wisdom is not sufficient to keep a man from sin. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And therefore he'll find justification for evil. Verse 8. And likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel which had appeared to him twice. Now get this. Here was a man with wisdom in all things pertaining to the material universe far in advance of his time and one to whom God had appeared and spoken twice. but he burns incense to the heathen idols of his many wives. He violates the provisions that God had made way back in the law of Moses when God said the day is coming when you're going to have a king. And there are certain, there are three things that you must bear in mind and that the king should know. Number one, he must not acquire a lot of horses from Egypt. Secondly, he must not acquire a lot of wives. And thirdly, he must have a copy of this law, a special copy of this law beside him at the throne at all times for consultation. Solomon violated all three. He was anxious to get those marvelous Arabian steeds. He multiplied wives and concubines and he ignored the written word of God. Wise? I tell you, that man is qualified to talk to the young man and say, I've tried it all. I looked at things under the sun. And it's all emptiness, vanity, vexation, vexation of spirit. It's a form of confession that this whole, the whole book of Ecclesiastes. And here, while we're in Kings, notice verse 10. And had commanded him concerning this thing, God having spoken, that he should not go after other gods but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. How reliable is human wisdom? How reliable is human know-how? 
It cannot keep a man from sin. What conclusion do you and I draw then from this portion of the book of Ecclesiastes? First of all, that the human heart is not a final nor a reliable authority at all. Nevertheless, sound reasoning now, if a man will stop and think about God and death and judgment, he is bound to sober up and realize that there is more than just living for eating and drinking and trying to have some fun. Then we notice too that man's wisdom is not in itself able to keep him from sin. I tell you, there is a doctrine that the Roman Catholic theologians once re referred to as a natural sin or inborn sin or inherited sin. And it has been criticized by Protestant theologians as well as others. But the fact remains that man is born a sinner. He's born with a sinful nature. And apart from God talking to him, number one, and man being obedient thereto, number two, he can only plunge himself into darkness. And if he's a king, he can plunge that nation into darkness. And if he's the leader in a republic, he can plunge that nation into darkness. Despite wisdom and skill and know-how and all of these things, they are only a part of man's fallen nature. He's a sinner. Is there anyone in this congregation who wants to stand up and say, that may be true of everybody else, but not me. When the scripture says that all have sinned and come short, that is, they continue to come short of the glory of God. So he's writing here in Ecclesiastes to uh, actually describe what he went through the conclusions that he had, and then the final conclusions to which he has come as he has come to his senses and begun to think things through from a little different standpoint. He is so anxious in the final that the young man learns to fear God. Start now as a young man. Fear God. Fear God. You're going to find injustices. You're going to find inequities in the world. You're going to find problems that you can't resolve. Remember, Solomon had a lot of wisdom, but he couldn't figure out why some wicked people were allowed to get away with it so long. He couldn't figure that one out. Nor could he figure out why some good people died young. He couldn't figure that one out either. And he couldn't understand in the days of his apostasy why when you have wine and wealth and works and all of this that it should be so empty. The reason is that he had walked out on God. And this is what he's getting through to this young man. And I'm sure that he had his own son Rehoboam in mind because in a very short time Solomon would die a repentant old man and his son Rehoboam would come to the throne and you know Rehoboam's record it's the record of a fool it is a fact my friend that this book does not go as far as the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at that next Lord's Day. But his emphasis is upon the fear of God. 
And you know that when a person really fears God for who he is, that man is well on his way to becoming a saved man. Sometime you might ask yourself, what value would any doctrine in the Bible have without the fear of God? Take, for example, the doctrine of sin. Why would that frighten us? And why would that humble us? Why would that cause us to, to seek for salvation if we do not fear God who hates sin? Take the doctrine of judgment that he develops quite clearly in this book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to be looking at it more next Lord's Day. The doctrine of judgment. We all, as professing Christians, subscribe to this, that there is a judgment of the quick and the dead and so forth that's been put in our creeds. But it has no meaning and no force in a person's life if he does not fear the God who is the judge. A God who cannot be bribed. A judge who is not looking at just a little bit of evidence, but he has the whole picture. Take the doctrine of eternal punishment, the doctrine of hell, any of these things. They strike no fear and get no response, no favorable response from men who do not fear God. And let's go to this most delightful of all doctrines, the doctrine of salvation, God's forgiveness and mercy and grace to those who come as penitents unto him. What meaning does that have? to people who do not know who God is. I tell you, it has great meaning for those of us who are saved. My own personal testimony is that it has great meaning for me because I believe in the security of the believer. I believe in eternal life for the believer. I believe in eternal bliss for the believer. Why? Because the eternal God whom I fear cannot lie and will not change. And when he has given his word as a bond for my eternal redemption, hallelujah, it stands. But without the fear of God, people are going to keep on playing with sin, living in sin, arguing about uh, 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 secondary matters, all finding all kinds of excuses for not getting right with God. My friend, you better learn to fear God. And when you fear God, a God who is able to put you with the devil and his angels in the lake of fire and is compelled by his own moral character to do so, you will humble yourself and cry out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The book of Ecclesiastes, we haven't come to the end of it yet, but <clears throat> the, when, at its conclusion, you have undoubtedly read it. I hope you have. I'm, I'm assuming that people are reading this book and soaking it in, you know, because if you don't, you've been wasting your time. And he says the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. Remember now, he's talking to a Jewish boy. He's talking to Jewish youth. They have the law of Moses. They have uh, the early part of the Old Testament scriptures. And so he's telling him, now this is your duty. You're part of God's chosen people. And if you want to come out right, you fear God. And you do as he says. You and I have the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus, which this book anticipates and that is how about the young man who says now a Gentile and he says well I haven't feared God and I haven't kept his commandments and I've sinned what is there for me the 
then it is our privilege to declare the gospel how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life God grant that as you go from the service today, you will go informed. Informed of the evil of the human heart. Of the inadequacy of human wisdom or abilities or knowledge or talents or anything else that we got from Adam or even accentuated by the mercy of God and realize that only when God has spoken and man obeys are the problems solved. Do you have a problem in your life? God has spoken. Will you be obedient thereto? There is no other solution. Remember the themes now that are underlying all of this. There is a God you're going to meet there is death and there is judgment prepare to meet thy God if I can be of any help you let me know won't you let us pray now our father we thank thee for thy holy word and we thank thee that thy word records for us accurately the musings the thinkings and the conclusions of a man who passed through this long state of apostasy and sin that we might learn from it what thou wouldst have us see the limitations of the wisest of men Lord, we are grateful for revelation. We're grateful for the disclosure of thyself. We're grateful for thy wonderful, wonderful word. For in it we learn who thou art. And it causes us to sing how great that thou art. Now dismiss us with thy blessing. Cause us to understand all of thy word. And sanctify us therein, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.